Hi, so today I'm going to give a brief overview of the work I did at my practicum and then talk about my latest work in quantum chemistry. Um, I first wanted to say thank you to the Krell Institute and DOECSGF for the incredible professional opportunities that this fellowship has offered me as well as the independence that um, a normal graduate student just doesn't get. Um, I've been able to work in fields far from my thesis research, which you'll see in the contrast between the work I did at, during my practicum as well as the one I did um, do normally. First, I'm going to give a very brief overview of my practicum research. I worked at Sandia in Albuquerque in the Computer Science Research Institute under Vita Sloan. I worked on subgraph isomorphism algorith algorithms for massively multi-threaded architectures. Graph problems are hard. A good review of why is published here in this um, article by Barry et al. Briefly though, graph problems are data-driven, um, usually rely upon data-driven applications, meaning one has little ideas to the problem prior to runtime, making it hard to develop good general parallel algorithms. They tend to be unstructured and have poor locality, making load balancing difficult. Lastly, they have a high data access to compute ratio, making it very difficult or making for long memory latencies. This means that deep memory hierarchies and other traditional high performance techniques are close to useless when it comes to graph problems. Thus, there's an interest in new architectures for these problems. Machines like the Cray XMT, um, which have a shared, completely flat, cacheless memory system and hardware support for up to 128 software threads per processor, um, at this machine one really interesting fact about it is that the processor switches between threads ready to work at every single cycle. Thus, it's able to tolerate rather than reduce latency. Um, additionally, there's an automated dynamic scheduling, which means that load balancing is not an issue. Memory contention, however, is still a problem. So using this machine, I developed a subgraph isomorphism algorithm. Subgraph isomorphism is a problem in which one is looking to find a mapping between a, the vertices of a smaller graph to the vertices of a larger graph such that the edge relationships are preserved. Here, there are two possible solutions. Um, this problem is hard for two reasons. The problem is NP-hard due to its exponentially growing solution space, and it is also a, just generally a graph problem with all the problems um, stated before. I spent the summer developing an algorithm specifically targeted towards this architecture. I took, my, uh, I took hints from previous algorithms, Ullman and VF2, and was able to develop an algorithm which scaled to around 1,000 threads, which I felt pretty good about considering how difficult this problem is. Um, the main bottleneck ended up being memory contention. Um, in summary, it was pretty neat to get to pretend to be a computer scientist for the summer. I got to work with a cool new architecture, which we would never use in quantum chemistry, and developed a new algorithm, which I was able to publish in the 2012 ACM Symposium on Parallel Arch um, Algorithms and Architectures, which I presented in Pittsburgh last month. Um, now, to change to a contrasting um, talk, what I usually do with my time, I'm going to talk about my latest work in quantum chemistry. Chemistry is governed by quantum mechanics, and the dynamics of molecules is governed by the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. If there are many particles, electrons, or spins, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation takes the following form. Um, this, that H with the little hat on it, the Hamiltonian, um, contains all the interactions between the electrons with each other, as well as the electrons with their environment, usually a field base um, generated by the nuclei. In NMR spectroscopy, we are looking at a system that, um, where the entities are spins and the external field is a magnetic one. Um, this, is, this is the application I'm mostly going to talk about later on in the talk. To simulate, sorry, um, one simulates this numerically by starting with initial state and applying time propagation operator, which comes from the solution to the time dependent Schrodinger equation. The ability to predict the outcome of these experiments theoretically is of much interest in the chemistry world. However, the, using the exact methods, the largest supercomputers can only simulate about 20 spins. I'm going to now talk about a small technical detail, which I'm going to mostly sweep under the rug for my talk. 
NMR experiments are actually open systems. The equations I showed you before are for closed systems. These equations are analogous, and for the problems and techniques I'm going to talk about, we can essentially ignore the fact that what I'm actually doing is working with an open system. All the problems are still present, they're just slightly more severe in an open system, and the techniques are easily extendable. So why is this problem so hard? The Hilbert space uh, I, um, associated with the general quantum system is huge. To parameterize the entire Hilbert space corresponding to n spins, we need a tensor that has a dimension two to the n. The two comes from the fact that spins have two states, spin up or spin down. Just storing this tensor requires an exponential amount of um, storage. Luckily, what we're actually interested in is physical systems. Physical systems only occupy a small part of the Hilbert space, typically, often the low energy space or some other corner which we can hope to take advantage of. There are several general strategies for approximation. The most obvious one is to a priori um, can find, restrict our basis to a smaller one than, the whole, than one that primarizes the entire space. This works well if we have a good idea from our physical knowledge of what, where the system sits. In NMR, we refer to this type of approximation as state space restriction. We basically take this large to the n tensor and assume that the vast majority of the entries are zero. This allows us to use algorithms which can take advantage of this sparsity. This is pretty advanced, especially, or these techniques are very advanced in quantum chemistry and are new to NMR in the last about three years. Um, they work pretty well as long as our system, act we actually have some good knowledge. For systems, however, um, for which we don't know so much about, it's much more difficult to decide a priori which basis set we should use, and thus these systems are not very, or these techniques are not very useful. A second um, technique people often use to compress the wave, or to only sample, is to only sample some small part of the wave function using something like quantum Monte Carlo. Brenda talked about this earlier. This method is very good for ground state problems, but doesn't work well when you're interested in dynamics, in the, like in the case of an NMR spectroscopy experiment. The third technique, which is what I'm going to focus upon, is the low dimensional factorization. One can take this high dimensional tensor and factor it into a product of lower dimensional tensors associated with each spin or electron, depending upon what you're trying to simulate. We can then truncate the size of these tensors, uh, um, uh, com thereby compressing the wave function. I'm going to focus on one particularly useful factorization, which is known as the matrix product state. This factorization is one such that each tensor is either a matrix, or if it's the last or first, a vector. In order for this form, which may be arbit seem arbitrary, to be useful, we, can answer, or we have to answer two questions. How do we actually find the elements that make this the best product state? And once we have, can we actually calculate real physical values, expectation values, directly from this without, say, converting back into the large high-dimensional tensor. For time-independent calculations, the answer to the, both these questions is yes, and has been known to be so since the 90s. Um, the, algorithm that, um, the algorithm that answers the first question is known as the density matrix renormalization group. I spent the first three years of my graduate work working on this algorithm, extensions and efficiency problems. Um, the second question is answered based upon the realization that clever tensor contractions can be used to efficiently calculate expectation values. However, in the time-dependent realm, matrix product states have not been widely adopted. This is primarily due to the fact that the two known algorithms um, both have problems. One is very efficient but has built-in inaccuracies. The second, while being very accurate within the, the best optimal wave function within this compressed form, uh, is very slow due to relying upon a nonlinear optimization. This leaved a hole, left a hole. We believed we could do better than this and find a good time-dependent algorithm using a matrix product state formulation. 
We found, um, working with my collaborator, Jesse Kinder, we were able to develop a new algorithm. The algorithm is published in a recent article in Advances in Chemical Physics and is up on the archive. Uh, this is my collaborator right there. Small picture of him. Um, the algorithm sidesteps the problems I re that give inaccuracies to the first algorithm and provably results in the optimal compressed wave function, avoiding the nonlinear optimization required previously. We did this by deriving equations of motion for the individual matrix elements. We were then able to linearize these, special, um, these equations by using a, this special structure of the matrix product state. Thus, we were able to develop an algorithm that was both fast and accurate. Um, the rest of the, uh, the result of the simulation is still a matrix product state, so we're still able to efficiently calculate expectation values through clever tensor contractions. We were able to get more out of this, however, and include efficient, um, efficient methods for computing the response functions and excitations, more time-dependent um, type properties um, or phenomena. Um, so this, this paper is very theoretical. There's no numerical calculations at all. So we need to know, now we know that the matrix product state can, in theory, be used to study dynamics, but we need to, is it useful? Can it actually be used for um, a real physical system? We're going to go back to our original example of NMR. We're going to talk about NM, and talk about NMR's sister experiment um, a spectroscopic technique known as electronic spin resonance, or ESR. The setup is pretty much the same as far as a theorist like me is concerned. One has a system of spins in some type of bath and a magnetic pulse is applied. We are then interested in the dynamics of the spins after this pulse. It sounds very similar, yet there are some key differences that make ESR experiments much more difficult to simulate than NMR. In an NMR experiment, the spins um, sit in a bath such that they are near to what we refer to as the high temperature limit. This means that all configurations of spins are equally likely. If you have two spins and four possibilities, spin up, spin up, spin up, spin down, etc., you only need the number one fourth to have all the information you need to know about this distribution. If we choose our initial basis cleverly, um, as the one such that all states are likely then choose a truncated basis by only including states that are of similar distribution, we can simulate NMR experiments with much fewer states. This is what we mean by the state space restriction, and it works pretty well for NMR. It was first implemented about three years ago by Ilya Kuprov, and, he, and his um, implementation has allowed people to model up to 40 spins versus the previous 20. For ESR, however, this temper high temperature limit does not apply. Due to the interaction of the electronic spins with the magnetic field, they are not all equally likely. Um, no one knows a priori which states of the system the ESR experiment will occupy. This means that you're not going to be able to use techniques like state space restriction. This is where matrix product states come in. One does not need to guess beforehand which basis states are good. The analytical time propagation scheme can guarantee one's ability to automatically end up in the optimal basis within the compression. We know that the SSR is good for some, or is good for, for the NMR, but we also know that MPS is more, and we now know that the MPS is more flexible. Um, one additional factor, we still don't necessarily know, though, if the MPS is going to actually work for these experiments. We need to do some real numerical calculations. Um, there's also one more question that I should address first. The rank of an MPS um, needed to guarantee the ability to at least cover the space of the state space restriction is at this point unknown. You might need a very large one, say. Uh, no one had ever studied the relationship between these matrix product states and the state space restriction uh, basis set. So we did a little bit of analysis. Um, 
we found that you can guarantee, theoretically, that your matrix product state is going to at least cover your state space restriction basis with at most in cubed storage. Remember, these tensors have a lot of extra elements in them because they're big matrices rather than just um, a single number per site. So we know, um, we also know that there are classes of matrix product states which cannot be represented as a state space restriction vector, whereas all state space restriction vectors can uh, then efficiently be represented as a matrix product state. Thus, we expect our fixed strength ma matrix product state to do better than a state derived from the state space restriction of similar size. Okay, let's see if this is true. Um, to assess the efficiency of the representation of the quantum state, we created a model system of interacting nuclei which is small enough to simulate exactly. Um, we are keeping it simple and looking at a chain of eight hydrogen atoms. We propagate the, the wave function exactly and at each time step compress the state into a matrix product state or project it onto the SSR basis. Um, so our numerical results are pretty promising. We can see in blue our matrix product state. This, this one is at a level of accuracy that, which requires 48 elements, where, and the SSR requires 67 elements. We see that the matrix product state does much better. A uh, key into why this is, is you can look at the number of non-zero elements in the, in the projected form. There's only 16 for the SSR. We didn't choose the basis that well. We see the same thing here. We have about similar accuracy when we go up to an SSR basis set with 175 elements and matrix product state with 96. If we increase our matrix product state to 160 elements, we have almost exact, um, exact accuracy. So these results, while preliminary, are promising. Um, in summary, we derived a new time propagation scheme for a beloved wave function, the matrix product state. Derived methods for computing important physical properties, such as response functions, physical pro and physical property, oh, sorry. We analyze the relationship between matrix product states and the state space restriction, and our initial numerical results are promising. The next step, and the last part of my thesis work, will be to implement this time propagation algorithm and, do, and apply it to some actual systems. <laughs>